Здравствуйте все! Я так рада тут быть. Это такой красивый город. Я всегда хотела пойти в Россию. Это мой первый раз тут. I'm not gonna give my talk in Russian. <laughs> Thank you. But I would love to speak with you in Russian after this. I'd never get a chance to talk in Russian at home and um, just meet me after if you have any questions. Today I'm going to be talking about CSS. Who here likes CSS? If your hand is down, leave the room. Okay, and just in case um, I try to be funny and not get a reaction, I made a little unicorn <laughs> that'll pop up and say laugh, and I also have a clap one. So, it, you know, in case I'm trying to get a reaction, <laughs> we, we've got that going for us. <clears throat> so let's get started. A little bit about me. This is when I was actually able to speak Russian. I learned it from a young age. I'm about four years old, maybe five in this photo. And I used to be like eating my chocolate, my babka, and like I would be reciting poems. And then I went to school in America and lost all of my Russian skills. So blame that girl. <laughs> But more importantly, this is who I am today. You can find me on the internet, on Twitter, on CodePen, on GitHub, at Yuna, just at UNA. I'm also a Google developer expert for web technologies. I now work at Bustle Digital Group as the director of product design. It's a digital publication that owns a few different web magazines that uh, focus on millennial women. I also have a podcast that's every other week called Tools Day. It's toolsday.io if you want to listen to tech tools, tips, and tricks every other Tuesday around 2 o'clock in the US. So let's get started with the CSS of today, the CSS of the present. And in order to do that, I want to bring us back into the headspace that Bjorn did such a good job yesterday of getting us into. This was a time when Jennifer Aniston and Matthew Perry were the most qualified technical advisors. A time when these were modern web browser icons. I don't know if you can see that, but that is the title of this image. A time when image mapping was a thing that we did here. We learned all about that. Like, this is when I first started learning how to code. I would image map, and it was magical. It was so cool. So let's talk about CSS hacks very quickly. We learned a ton of them yesterday, so I'm not going to go too in-depth. But I do want to show you some sites that people put together um, to showcase these CSS hacks. This is a site by Paul Irish that people used to have to like, figure out what matches in certain browsers in order to make the web work the way they wanted it to. This is a mess. But now we have at supports. We have these queries that Brenda showed us yesterday that we can use when we want to use newer CSS properties. And this is something that's super, super powerful. So we see this a lot with grid. You just have to have at supports display grid. And then whatever you write inside of that query is going to be used by browsers that support grid. Now, IE11 does not support this, as you saw. So you do have to be careful when you do use at supports and have fallbacks outside of that at supports query so that your users in IE11 can see a website or get some kind of good experience. So the next thing I want to talk about is this null transform hack, this thing that people used to do where you would have to do transform translate Z or translate 3D000. Now, there's pros and cons to this. So the pros are that it composites layers together. You use GPU acceleration instead of CPU, so it's a smoother animation. And layers get their own backing surface. So if you're doing transformations, you don't get some weird, janky experience every time. It does use more memory. And you do have to watch out about battery usage, especially on mobile for that. And sometimes they appear more pixelated. So there are pros and cons. But we no longer have to do that because we have will change. And you can apply will change to any property. Will change is supported by Firefox, Chrome, Safari, not by Edge and IE, but it's a progressive enhancement, and it's not going to make the experience for Edge and IE users drastically different. So you can absolutely use it today as an enhancement for your users for better performance. And I'm briefly, briefly going to talk about CSS Grid, because Brenda did such a good job yesterday going over the entirety of how to use it and some great practical examples for its usage. But I want to show you some really interesting creative experiments that Jules Forrest put together. So Jules, what she did was she found inspiration in the real world and then applied it with Grid. So found magazine layouts, uh, menus. And now with Grid, all of this can be natively coded, which means that you get the SEO benefits. You get all of 
of this as a responsive layout that your users can really interact with. And that is what I think the true power of Grid is. You can also do a couple of fun things with Grid. I personally love Grid Template because it lets you lay out your entire application visually. If you use Emoji, it's a nice placeholder to show you just a visual map of your entire area's layout. And you can use Grid Template, Grid Area to then apply that template area to any part, any div inside of your application. So I love to use uh, Emoji with this grid. You can apply Grid Gap. It's a really powerful thing. And also powerful are the new units that we have. So this is something you can do for the first time with Grid. You can create these sort of headers that expand and contract no matter what size of text you put in them, and they could be dividers in your page. And this is because of some of those new units that we have. So this is just fractional units and auto spacing. Hello, world. You, you saw this yesterday, but this is just a demonstration of how this works. You have your grid gap, you're aligning your item centered, and then you have your fractional units on the side. This isn't going to expand if I put more text into it because it's taking the rest of that space that's not taken up by the auto unit in the center. And that's why we can do things like this with these headers. So support for Grid, as you saw, is pretty darn good. Um, I'm not going to go too much into it, but use Grid today. Use it in a progressively enhanced way. In order to help you with that, I made this site called gridtoflex.com. And on that site, it just has a couple of layouts and component layouts that have Flexbox fallbacks for IE 11 and have Grid implementation for future forward thinking. Now, when I design now, I think about CSS Grid, and then I uh, think about the Flexbox fallback. It helps me to contextualize and figure out where I want things laid out on the page to really help design web today. OK, so the next really exciting thing that we have are true CSS variables. Who here has used custom properties in CSS? OK, that's like a third of you. But oh, these are so good. It's, it's, it's like we haven't had these before. So in CSS, we've always had things that helped us with CSS, things like SAS. You could have SAS variables. But we were never had real variables that you can update dynamically. Those SAS variables just compile down to a standard color or whatever value you assigned to them. But here, we can dynamically update variables with JavaScript. So what you do is write document, document element, .style, set property, And we're setting this on the root. So you say color primary, because that's the name of this variable that I'm calling. And right now, it's red. This is the color red. But Maybe I want to set it to blue. And it can animate and interoperable because you can apply different CSS properties on it. You can use physics and JavaScript to pass values into your CSS. So now for the first time ever, we have real dynamic variables. And you can write things in JavaScript that let you create logical um, calculations that you're then passing into CSS. That's really exciting. David Corshi did a really great talk last year about reactive animation and how he was using JavaScript to then pass values into CSS. I think that's a great workflow. So that's really exciting. Support for variables is here. It's also very well supported. It's not supported in IE, so you will have to deal with that fallback if you support IE users. Um, but it is supported in Edge for a few versions now, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, et cetera. So definitely look into using custom properties. CSS variables is like the fake name for it, but it sounds nicer than CSS custom properties. But just know those are the same thing. OK, so I want to talk about CSS filters really quick. Um, I love CSS filters. This is one of my favorite parts about CSS, CSS filters and blend modes. CSS filters are really cool because they also are interoperable. That means that because there are two different values, you can um, move from one value to the other, and the browser calculates the in-between steps. So if I have a transition here, you see all those steps changing. And there's a few things that we can do with filters. You can adjust the brightness, so you can set it to be really bright. You can set it to be very dim. So if it's less than one, that brightness is actually going to make it dim. You can increase or decrease the contrast. So decreasing the contrast to half makes it less contrast. I can set it to 0. It turns to a 50% gray. I can set the contrast to 2, and it gets rid of some of those mid-tone values. You can set a drop shadow in here. You can set a hue rotation. That's a fun one. I love to hue rotate, like, let's say, 30 degrees. Now, all of these colors are changed on this little unicorn. 
You could even have custom filters. So CSS filters actually stemmed from SVG filters as a shortcut for a lot of things that people were doing with SVG filters. But you can create an SVG on your page and reference the SVG filter inside of CSS. So here, I just have a SVG with a glitch filter on it. And it just adds a glitch effect to my image. So I would have to have like a, a little SVG filter ready for that. But with uh, SVG filters, the thing to note is that they are not interoperable. They don't animate. You can animate all the SVG, um, sorry, the CSS filter properties, but not SVG. But it does allow for a lot of really powerful control over your images that can then cascade through your entire application. So I love filters. You can even use filters with SVG icons to make like an interesting little performance hack. Here I have these white icons, and I can change this color to anything. Right now I have a hue rotate here. It's not doing anything. Um, and that's because we have to have a couple of steps first. So first, I'm going to set to sepia one. And it hasn't really done much yet. You haven't really seen the effect yet. But then I can also increase the saturation. So I could saturate it like say 10 or maybe even 100, and now we have this bright yellow color. So this is the point at which I can add a hue rotation. So I can hue rotate, uh, let's say, 30 degrees. I don't know why I use that number. I could, you can even use a negative number. Um, I can make 130. You can change this color to anything you want. So you can have just um, a single icon and then change this with using filters inside of your code to get that Facebook color, to get your Twitter color, to get all your social media colors. You don't need to have different SVGs. And this is very useful if you can't access the fill color of the SVG. In order to access fill for an SVG, you have to have an inline SVG on your page. But if your SVG is used as a background image, then you don't get that kind of access. So that's where this becomes very useful. You can also use. Um, these filter functions with text. And that really reminds me of the SAS color functions that I knew and loved from SAS and Compass when I was first like getting really into the sort of stuff. So with SAS, you had the functions of lighten, darken, adjust, hue, saturate. This is part of what SAS gave us as the core base. We can do all of these things by using filters. So here, I'm just going to show you, um, oh, I could usually zoom in. Um, here, it's just filter brightness, filter um, higher than one, less than one, the hue rotation, the saturation. All of this you can do on images, on text, on icons. It's more than just on photos. So you can use this anywhere within your UI. That's why it's really, really powerful. And support is pretty good for CSS filters also. Um, it is All the ones I showed you here are supported in Edge, Firefox, Chrome, Safari. So they're pretty safe to use today. You do have to set fallbacks for IE. Uh, the one thing that you don't want to do is have a white icon that has a filter applied to it on a white background. Even though you'll see that in Edge, Firefox, and Chrome, your IE users will not see the icon. And that will become an issue. So you can have any color icons, like blue, black, red, anything, and then apply the color transformation to each of those individually. That's a little bit of a safer approach. OK, so who here has heard of display contents? Cool, some of you. That's more than I expected. Display contents is a way to avoid hacking away like inherited parent styles. So anything that's applied to the um, layout, like the ge geometry of that element, is going to be gone when you say display contents, because we just want the contents inside of that element. So you get these pass-through parent styles. And it's easier to show than to say what that means. So here we have a flex container with these couple of items. We have this div that's called multi-items with display contents on it. But if I, if I apply that, if I apply display contents, you see that all of the styling, that border, the padding, it goes away. This is a pass-through parent style, so we can allow for those elements to continue in the flow of that flex box grid. You can continue doing this. So I think a good example to show this is a list. So we, here we have just a list example with an unordered list. If I apply display contents, then you just see the contents inside of that. So all you see are the padding and background of the children element here, the list items. But then if I apply display contents to the children, all you see is the actual text. Because what we're saying is get rid of the parent style. So this is actually very useful for Flexbox and for some grid elements when you don't want the parent uh, when you want the parent style to be applied to the children, maybe in a responsive way, um, you can use this in your UI. So I thought this is an interesting property that not that many people know about. Support is uh, decent. It's supported in Firefox, Chrome, Safari, 
Android, Android browser. It's not supported in Edge, unfortunately, and I don't think they have any plans anytime soon to support it. So that's really been the blocker to getting this uh, in popular use. All right, Focus Within is a very cool property as well. Who here has heard of Focus Within? Yeah? OK, less people, but Focus Within is so useful. It's actually pretty, um, pretty new. So Focus Within allows you to style an element when focus is trapped anywhere within it. I'll show you why that's important. So here we have a regular standard uh, header. We see these commonly. We have a sub nav. You hover over it to get inside of it. But when you have something like this and you want to then tab through it, you can't see those children elements. This is really bad for accessibility because you can't get to those children elements. You're only focusing on the parent. And that's because this is doing what we're expecting it to do. We're applying a style when you focus on or hover the parent element. But when you focus on or hover the children inside of it, we lose the focus on the parent element. So it's no longer getting that style applied to it. And the style that's applied to it is display block to show those children elements. And that's a problem. So with focus within, we get the same experience where we can focus through the different images in this, I mean, the different items in this list. And when we tab through it, we also maintain the focus of the parent element. So you get that accessibility benefit by applying this with your focus um, features in CSS. So when you apply focus, you can apply focus within along with it. Um, and then you have a nice little accessible, well, more accessible uh, drop down for your UI. So support is. Firefox Edge, uh, Firefox Chrome Safari, not supported in Edge. But if you do want this feature, I think it's a really important one to have. Please upvote it on Edge user voice. This is a trend that we're going to start seeing throughout this talk a little bit more. So um, yeah, just, just be aware of the support tables. <laughs> so let's talk about the CSS of tomorrow now. Ooh, this is exciting. Um, if you remember Brenda's talk from yesterday, if you're here, this is the part of the talk where we're going to have this emotional reaction to new CSS specs, um, where a lot of what I'm talking about is not well supported or not supported at all. So just be aware. Remember, remember Brenda <laughs> glaring at all of you from the stage. Um, I'm just warning you. This is a warning. So to understand this section, I want to quickly talk about the W3C drafts. An editor's draft is a working document by an individual or a group. Then there's a working draft, which is sort of like a fixed point. So often there's editor's drafts and working drafts at the same time. So you've got your working draft and editor's draft will kind of like commit to it. And uh, that's sort of published by the W3C for the community. Then you have a candidate recommendation. This is a document that's been reviewed and satisfies the working group's technical requirements. It becomes a proposed recommendation by the W3C for final endorsement. And finally, it becomes a W3C recommendation. And that becomes a recommended web standard. So this is sort of the process that it goes through. Uh, most of the time is spent in working draft stage with editors' drafts kind of contributing occasionally to it. So let's talk about variable fonts. Variable fonts are super, super, super cool. They allow for multiple weights, widths. These are just beginnings of what we can do with variable fonts. There's so many different options of things that we can do that people are experimenting with that I think is really, really exciting. Um, this I saw an example in Access Praxis where not only are they affecting the weight, they're also affecting the fit and size inside of a container, which was really interesting. Um, there's also animations that you can do with variable fonts. So this is interesting. It's a font called Moybridge. Um, and what they're doing here is creating this keyframe variant, and it's going linear infinite. Um, and what they're setting here is font, font variation settings. So they're setting time, and it's a 1,000. There's like a 1,000 characters that's looping through. If you set it to 500, you can see that it breaks the cycle of this animation. I don't know if this is a good idea. <laughs> I don't think this is a good idea. But it's interesting that people are experimenting in this way, thinking about variable fonts outside of the box of just typography. Like, this is interesting to me. I love Decovar. It's a great example of the capabilities of variable fonts. Um, so this is the live site for Decovar. It has all of these different glyphs. It has all of these different skeletons. It has a lot of different terminals, too. So the cool thing about Decovar is you can have a serif font right here and a sans serif font 
within the same typeface. So you only have to install one font, maybe, that's the idea here, and you get a slab serif, you get a rounded sans serif, it's all of these options within a single variable font. So this is just a great example of the capabilities of variable fonts. Um, they're not too well supported yet, but we are seeing some improvement. Edge is actually ahead of Firefox for this, which is cool to see. Um, so I think it's a great time to experiment with them. Be careful of the size of the variable font, because that might actually be bigger than like the savings you're getting from not sending multiple font files to your users. So just be cognizant of all of that, um, and definitely just I think it's a great time to experiment, but maybe not push to production, this sort of thing. That's why it's in like the future CSS stuff. These are two really good resources if you're into variable fonts, accesspraxis.org and v-fonts.com. Every single variable font that I think exists is on vfonts, and you can just scroll through all of them and see all of the different things, all the different variables that change for that font. Um, there's color fonts on there. There's like different like animated things. So it's just like, it's an interesting time. We'll say that. Next thing I want to talk about is text decoration. We all use this all the time, um, but there are things you might not know about the text decoration property, and those things are that you can affect every a few different things about this. So text decoration is used typically for underlines and text. You can also now change the color of the text decoration, like that underline. You can change the style so they're solid. You can set it to dashed. You can set it to wavy. You can set it to double. Um, you can do a lot of different things with this text decoration property. I'm going to set it back to solid. You can even make it a overline, or you can do a strike through. We've seen that with the strike through property. Um, my favorite thing about text decoration that you can do today is text decoration skip ink. Okay, text decoration skip ink allows you to skip those descenders. So we used to have to hack around this by setting an outline on our text and then using a border bottom that has a negative Z index. But now you can, with one property in CSS, just skip all those descenders. It makes for a much better reading experience. This is, everything I showed you is supported in these browsers. So definitely try it out. It's a single line of code. It's a progressive enhancement. Um, not supported in Edge yet, but super, super useful. You can do all those things with just a single line of CSS. So I want to talk about image set. Oh, who here has heard of image set? OK, I, I didn't think so. Image set is very, very cool. Let's talk about image first. In image, you can have source set. Source set is a property that works with image. And what source set does is allows you to send different sized images based on the pixel density of the device which your user is viewing your website through. So you could send a smaller image for a one times pixel density or a larger image for two times pixel density. Now, you can do this with picture element. There's been a lot of ways that you can do this in the browser, in line on the page. But now, for the first time, we can do this as a background. So we can set the background image, image set, and then send different images for retina or non-retina backgrounds. So you can see that this screen here is a non-retina screen, but you can also test this in Google Chrome. So in the Chrome inspector, there's a little pull down here with, uh, it says laptop with medium DPI screen and laptop with high DPI screen. So you can actually test this in your browser for retina and non-retina. That's a little fun fact too. So image set is really powerful. It allows you to send more performant images to your users, making sure you're not sending massive retina images to users who don't have retina screens. And that's like a huge performance boost. So check out image set. It's not well supported. Remember that graph, my friends. Um, it is supported in Chrome and Safari. It is not supported in IE Edge or Firefox. Uh, so use with care. That's all I can say about that. OK, so now I want to talk about scroll snap. Scroll snap basically allows you to set snap points when you're scrolling. And this is something that we've kind of been hacking all along. That's kind of how CSS works. We create a hack, then we create a fix, then we make it a best practice in CSS. But this allows us to set a scroll snap type. So that could be x or y, a padding on that snap, and then an alignment. So it can align left, right, et cetera. There are some great examples on the web that I'm going to uh, show you. So this is a normal scroll. 
This is just on webkit.org, right? So it's not snapping. But then scroll snap allows us to create this sort of like physics that when you've reached past a certain point, it will snap to the next image. If you don't, if you don't uh, move it enough, it, it won't do that. I can't even move it like, s in, like slightly enough, but it will go back to the initial point if it hasn't been moved enough. So these demos can um, get really creative. You can snap different points, snap different sizes. Um, here's like a center snap, so it'll like kind of like, oh, it's over snapped, then it goes back to the center. Um, and you can like play with changing the directionality of your CSS. So this is just webkit.org demos. You can go and play with scroll snap. The support is decent. Um, this is a lie because I'm in Chrome right now and it's working. So this is a live site too, it's just outdated. Um, but Edge Firefox supports it, Chrome does support it, because I just showed it to you, Safari supports it. So you can really start playing with this today. Um, it's supported in different ways. Some of the scroll snaps have different physics and different levels of fidelity. Um, so just be aware that it's like a slightly different experience, but it could be something that you want for carousels or for any other UI element that uses a scroll snap. Okay, so rhythmic sizing is the next thing I want to talk about. This is a typography thing um, that is snap-like, but it allows you to snap to a baseline. If you've ever had like a term paper due and you have to print it out, but you have no printer paper, you just have like lined paper, if you've ever printed it, it's just never aligned in that paper. It's like all over the place. W was that just me? That was always me. Um, <laughs> But this fixes that for us. So what this allows us to do is set a line height step that we can set a grid, right? So a baseline. And that text, this body text, is going to be aligned to that grid. So we have consistent vertical rhythm now for the first time. It's very, very cool. In the second example with the H1, we're doing two times that grid, so it ends up being centered in that grid too. So that's, that's what happens when you apply math to it. So you can uh, create these different vertical rhythms that we couldn't really m do before. We, we didn't have that perfect baseline snap. So this is something that the W3C is looking into. I think it's really interesting, but it's currently in a working draft state, which means you can't, you can't use it yet. This is just to show you browser support, question mark. <laughs> Um, shape inside is also interesting. Currently, we have shape outside, which allows for you to place shapes in a UI, and the text will flow around it. The other divs will flow around it. That's a much easier problem to solve than shape inside, because what do you do with the content when it flows out of that shape? That's why we haven't had shape inside yet, but developers and W3C are still looking into what this could look like and what it could mean. So this is sort of like what that could mean if you have a circle with a uh, shape inside, you have a uh, shape inside display, you can visually see things inside of a single display. And this is really great for round displays. CSS is really spreading past browser screens, and that's so, so, so exciting. You now are accessing the internet on your phones, on your watches, on your refrigerators, on your cars, and that's why we need things like round display. This is an editor's draft, but let's, let's take a look at that as well. So this is not the same as the shape inside. Round display allows us to create any other property but base that on the display. So here's like border boundary, and border boundary theoretically would always be a rectangle before and currently, but in the future we might have this ability to set the border boundary to display, having a round display, something that the browser, no matter what kind of browser it is, recognize. So you can create different types of interfaces for your watch or for any other non-standard display and have that be a good, interesting user experience. People are now using JavaScript and CSS to code apps for watches. Like People are using JavaScript and CSS to code apps for cars. It's, it's a very exciting world. I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> it's working draft, though. You know, you know how it goes, my friends. Let's talk about conic gradients. Conic gradients are great. There's so many uses for them. If you've heard of Leah Veru, she does a really, um, she made this conic gradient polyville. She used to give talks about conic gradients and all their different use cases. You can use them for pie charts, for interesting backgrounds. Um, so many, like this is a great site that has a lot of different use cases. It's leahveru.github.io slash conic gradient. 
and she's been a real champion for conic gradients for a long time. We don't currently have this ability. But the browser support, <laughs> it's not there yet. <laughs> it's a working draft. But we have Houdini! Yay! Okay, who here has heard of Houdini? Then why aren't you more excited? Not that many of you have heard of Houdini, but I'm so excited to tell you about Houdini because it's like the coolest thing. And when people are like, what's the feature of CSS? I'm like, it's Houdini, it's not J, whatever. Anyway, this is Houdini, and this is how Houdini works. So, Previously, we used to be able to change CSS with JavaScript, right? You can change it with using the DOM. You can style things with JavaScript as polyfills. So what JS polyfills do is they can affect the DOM, and then they go through the entire cascade, layout, paint, composite steps that the browser uses to render a web page. With Houdini, we, for the first time, have access to the CSS object model itself. So you can write worklets, Houdini worklets, and then use them in CSS natively. So it saves them performance because um, it, it doesn't have to go through another repaint. It just affects it right from the CSS while it's painting. Um, you can normalize cross-browser differences. And most importantly, you can build new features without waiting on browsers to implement them. Because now we can create true CSS polyfills. Once browsers have implemented Houdini, you can just write directly to the CSS OM. And that's so cool. OK, so this is like the working stages of Houdini. They're, I'm going to read these out loud because it's kind of small. Um, there's a few different APIs that Houdini uses uh, or is working on. There's the Layout API. There's the Paints API, which I'll be showing you today because it's the only one that's like sort of ready-ish to be even played with. Um, there's the Parser API, Properties and Values API. There's the Animation Worklet. And there's the Typed Object Model, as well as the Font Metrics API. So this is um, how browsers are implementing it and what the W3C spec is saying. So is Houdini ready yet is like your source for HoudiniReadiness.com. There it is. I'll show you some examples. This is an example by Will Boyd. He wrote a really good article about Houdini. And I'm going to try to zoom in. I used to, you know what, maybe if I just do this. There we go. All right, so what I'm showing you here is this example that he created with these Xs as like a mock-up example. And um, he is just applying in CSS a background image paint placeholder box. So the way that this is happening is in JavaScript, yes, you have to write JavaScript. It's very Canvas-like, the syntax. Um, you specify, you register paint, and then you can just use the context and the size of that context to write your code. So he's saying, like, draw a path that's two pixels thick from the top left corner, from the top right corner, and add a stroke on that path. And then he's registering the paint, calling it placeholder box, and exporting all of this. You do have to import it in CodePen. Like, you kind of have to fudge this a little bit, like fake it. Um, here's like you importing that worklet. Um, it says this paint worklet dot add module, and this is the CodePen name. You, it's like kind of weird right now because it's very experimental and CodePen doesn't really work. But once you do that, then you can just in CSS create these polyfills, and now you can say paint placeholder box on any placeholder. So you get everything that you've set up in this code in your UI through CSS, through the CSS OM. There are a lot of great examples of this. Um, this was just one that I was playing with. So I was playing with like different colors and really just kind of experimenting with Canvas and seeing what I could do there. So I created this rainbow ties. I registered a rainbow ties worklet. And then I uh, used the size. I created the size of these elements. I created just different squares based on where they were in space and time and color, and then just applied that through CSS. Very simple code here, just background image, paint, rainbow ties. I was just like playing with a couple of color loops in JavaScript. And here's my like weird, I don't know why you'd use this, but you know, it's experimental, just example. <laughs> you can also now, for the first time, create smoothly transitioned gradients. I know we're going to hear talk about gradients later, but on the left is what we currently have. On the right is what we could have once we're able to register properties, a smooth transition. Now, what that looks like is this. 
Here you have CSS.register property, and you can register these different color stops. Currently, you cannot transition gradients, but if you're transitioning two different colors and you're using them to create a gradient, then that's totally animatable. So what we're doing is we're registering color stop one, inheriting from color property. We're setting that value to transparent. It doesn't really matter because we're going to set it individually. And then in the CSS, what we're doing is we're setting color stop one, color stop two to hot pink and red, and then transitioning those on hover through using CSS variables to blue and lime green. CSS variables really have allowed for a lot of these things, like Houdini, um, to be something that we can really use and make dynamic. So now, because I've registered these two properties individually, I can animate them. And it's like a gradient, but it's a, gr it's a real gradient. I've just set the properties. And it's just like, oh, it just makes me so happy. So that's something that you can do with CSS Houdini. Um, this is like <laughs> also something you can do. This is a bug that it's repainting all of, all of these dots. Uh, I show you this as an example of what you shouldn't do. This is another example that I experimented with on my code pen. Um, here I'm painting like a thousand, maybe even more dots per div to show you that while this can improve performance because we're running through the CSSOM, it can also make things really janky and slow for your users if you do stupid things like this. Um, so just like, it's, it's a lot of power, but with great power comes great responsibility. So just don't, don't do this. Uh, Will Boyd has much better examples. He has like these cool like hover uh, examples on his site. Even better examples are IMVDO's CSS-Houdini.rocks website. And this is where like conic gradient comes in because I'm gonna open this in Canary because a lot of it's experimental. Um, let me refresh. Oh no, my internet. OK, well, one second. I'm going to connect because this is, this is important to show. Um, he shows like conic gradients, corner gradients, a lot of different examples here. All right, I think we're, we're on roll. There we go. Ah, see, it is like kind of slow right now because it is very experimental, um, but if I if you don't believe me, check it out in your browser. I don't know why it's broken right now. Um, you can do corner gradients, slanted backgrounds. There's like, you can do like interesting checkboxes with interesting animations. Um, there's tool tips. Here you can like play with tool tips and just doing all of this through Houdini with paint tooltip. Like, can you imagine having just a single property that you're applying to an element? Like that's so, that's so cool. I'm um, changing the different sizes here. Uh, the corner shapes I thought was an interesting use of Houdini also. Here you can change the corner radius and the shape. So like bevel, like this is, you can't do this right now, but you can do it maybe in the future soon. It's like there's so many things that you can do. Um, there's also element queries experimentally. Element queries are uh, queries on individual elements. So instead of looking at the media size of the page itself, you can look at where that individual element is placed and what the size of its parent is to apply styles, which is great for design systems. Um, and this is my favorite example. It's SVG path layout. So in this example, you can play with this path and have these elements like change their justification, change the angle of this movement. You can add items, you can remove items, and this is all capable through Houdini. So CSSHoudini.rocks is such a good resource. I highly recommend you check it out. Um, I feel like this should, you know what? I'm just gonna let it go. I'm gonna let it go, yeah. OK, so I want, to sh I want to just sprinkle you all with some Houdini magic. Thank you, Brittany, for doing it for me. Um, this is what I think is the future of CSS, and I cannot wait. If you are into this sort of thing, see also uh, fill in stroke level three. I didn't talk about that, but if you write a lot of SVG, this sort of describes where the fill and stroke go, outside or inside. Um, color level four allows for lab colors, a lot of really um, minute details for how your color space is treated. That's really interesting. Selectors level four. You can see all the drafts at drafts.cssswg.org. And if you're as nerdy as me, you can just kind of like check up on them occasionally and see what's happening in the world of CSS. But CSS is amazing. This is like, 
what makes me love my job so much? That there are developers who are thinking about ways that we can make our web beautiful and how we can start coding in a different way and how we can bridge the gap between interaction and with the JavaScript and CSS and how we can make a good developer experience happen for, for us to have a good user experience for our users. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much. Oh, Yuna, wonderful. Yeah. Would you like to join me for a little conversation? I would love to. Thanks for such a comprehensive overview of what's happening. Oh, there's That's so many things, Italy. Yes, I know. What's, do you read all the specs the at night? During like, uh, you know, in the Sunday evenings, you just print out the spec and... Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> but I do read them occasionally. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, questions. I have many questions. We don't have that much time, but I do have many questions. Um, one of them that actually came up a lot. Um, when you think about display contents, right? So in many ways, we can mimic things like subgrid, CSS grid, sub, CSS grid, subgrid. Mm -hmm. um, this way, when we're building layouts, uh, but it's not really a replacement for subgrid, is it? No. So do you, do you know if anything is going to happen with subgrid? I know that they're working on it. Um, I've heard Jen Simmons answer this exact question before, and she basically just said they're working on it. It's definitely the next spec level for grid. So TBD. Uh, it's, it's probably also, also a good idea to, to explain what it actually does. Uh, so subgrid. So th some of the things I was showing you there um, with display contents allows for you to kind of like pass through those parent styles of grid. What subgrid allows for you to do is apply grid to elements in a grid in a different way. So it doesn't also take the parent elements grid, um, and that's why you can like kind of hack it with this, but it's like it not really. Um, and so once you're really starting to play with grid a lot you can run into these issues where the parent grid is defining the children's layout, and you don't want that. So subgrid is something that the CSS working group is also working on to fix and correct that yeah, issue. Exactly. And another thing that uh, comes up as well, I'm really super excited about Houdini as well. Um, one thing that does show up when you talk to developers or so CSS people in general about um, these things. Shouldn't, browser, shouldn't browsers know what to do anyway? Shouldn't they just implement stuff? Like in many ways, we had this conversation, I think, a couple of years ago when jQuery was still a big thing. Who is still using jQuery, by the way? It's a safe place you can share. Yeah. That's OK. Um, but when we talk about jQuery in the past, there were many people talking about jQuery should become the part of the browser so we don't have to include it. In the same way, all those things, like little properties here and there, Shouldn't the shouldn't browser actually take care of proper text decoration ink without us having to define it? And in fact, I think that in this way, Chrome is already doing the right thing by removing the descenders, lines over the descenders. So we're giving all this control. Well, they are giving us. Well, we are giving all this control to us, right? Um, mm -hmm. But where is this line, fine line, where things just should be done, and when we should get all the access to everything in the world? So you said that's with great exactly power comes great is. responsibility. Yeah. Right? Um, browsers are doing a good job of implementing things that developers deemed important. CSS variables, like that was definitely heavily inspired by these massive use of SAS in order to have variables. With jQuery, that inspired a lot of the changes for ES6. Like that's exactly how it works. It's like paving the cow paths. Like once developers have decided this is the way, then they change it. With Houdini, it allows for us not to have to wait for browser vendors. I don't know if anyone here has worked at a big company, but like I used to work at IBM, and I'm telling you, it took a lot longer <laughs> to get anything done there than it does at a much smaller company. So browsers have also politics to deal with. It takes a long time to implement it, so it's core to the browser without breaking anything before it and, and like implement it in a performant way. So now uh, what Houdini allows us to do is to show the browsers, in a way, what is important to us. People can create CSS libraries with Houdini that people can then use on their site. So you can have a jQuery with Houdini in the future. And then the CSS spec naturally could meld to that if there's something that people are using very frequently. OK, so we will we'll be able to do whatever we want. Yeah. That's great. That sounds very exciting. Yeah. So are you ready for the theater tonight? Oh, yeah. I'm seeing a ballet tonight. I'm very excited. Oh, everybody's going like, oh. Yeah. Oh, Thank this you is for this uh, airing my schedule to that's, everyone. <laughs> that's my pleasure. That's my pleasure. Uh, we'll be there as well, by the way, just saying. Yeah, but I'll be around all day today. If you have any questions, I'd love to chat. Um, about CSS or also other things? About CSS, JavaScript. Life. 
JavaScript. We could talk about JavaScript. I write React all day now. Okay. All right. So this is my thank you so much, Shina, for being. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Very well done.